You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Neil, there's there's been so many great Ashes moments at Lords over its long history, over 200 years, as we said earlier. Um, just to name a few, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Don Bradman's 254 in 1930, which was his first tour to England. Uh, Bob Massey, who took 16 wickets on debut in 1972. Mm-hmm. Keith Miller, the great all-rounder from Australia, who was a fighter pilot in World War II, mm-hmm. took 10 wickets in his last test at Lords in 1956. Battle of the Ridge, test match in 1961, Bill Laurie scoring 130 against Statham and Truman. <coughs> Glenn McGrath's 8 for 38 in 1997 and his 500 wickets in 2005. Mm-hmm. And Andrew Flintoff's 5 for 92 in 2009, which was his last test at Lords, And um, he announced his retirement from test cricket. So, so there's so many Ashes moments in mm-hmm. test matches at Lords. Neil. What can you tell us about some of those moments? And I, we'll, we'll get to Bradman's 254. We'll keep that separate. So the other moments I just listed there, what can you tell us about those great moments I listed um, in that short list? Well, I mean, Keith Miller was one of those Australian cricketers who immediately felt at home at Lords as soon as he came here. He was he was great friends with Dennis Compton and Bill Edrich. Um, of course, he, he he played at Lords for the first time um, during the wartime matches in 1945, the famous victory tests. Although his his best um, his his really great innings that summer of 185 was. Um, was played for the Dominions against England. It wasn't in one of the, the victory tests. And that was, I think Pelham Warner said that was one of the greatest innings he'd ever seen at Lords. Um, but I, I don't think he'd had a lot of success with the ball before 56. So, so to come back and actually take 10 wins mm-hmm. in the match was, and, and he was, you know, he'd, he'd been a fast bowler for a long time. I guess he was at the sort of Jimmy Anderson stage of his career yeah. then, where he probably wasn't as rapid as he'd been in 48 or even in 45. Um, but he was a wily old cricketer and he still knew how to manipulate the ball and he knew how to take wickets. Yep. And and it would have been great for him to, to make that achievement. I mean, you, you look at some of the players who've never made it onto the honours boards, the likes of Brian Lara, Sachin Tendulkar, mm. Kumar Sangakara, I think they did it at the seventh attempt. Um, yep. Ricky so, Ponting never scored a century at Lords. Ricky Ponting never scored a century at Lords. Oh. I mean, it's astonishing to think how, and Shane Warne, Shane Warne never, yep, never, never took a five, yeah. five at, at Lords. How many people have not achieved that? So when you've, you've You've had a go, and you've had another go, and another go, and then finally, you, it, it's it, admittedly there, there were no honours boards at the time, but I'm sure it yeah. was still, it was still a, felt to be a great achievement to score a century or take five wickets in an innings at Lords. Ten wickets in a match is is doubly good, of course. So, and Keith, of course, was one of the great glamour boys of, of cricket in that immediate mm. post-war era. He was, he was such a popular popular figure with with the English and Australian cricket fans alike, um, and. You know, it, we, we've got a portrait of him in the pavilion. Um, it's it's just it's a shame from my point of view that it was painted when he was a very old man, so you don't really yeah. get the sense of that vigor and that glamour yeah. that surrounded him um, in in his youth. He was yeah, you know, he was a, he was a good looking fella as well when he was mm. a young man. Um, so you can understand why a, a lot of the, the ladies of England swooned over him when he was on tour over here. So that that was a that was a, a tremendous um, feat by. By one of the, the most exciting cricketers ever to have set foot at Lords. Um, the, the Battle of the Ridge, I mean, I don't recall the details of the match so much in 1961, but the Ridge was one of those. I remember when I was started watching cricket seriously in the 1980s, people were still talking about the Ridge, even though everybody at Lords would say, no, no, we got rid of that years ago. It, it doesn't mm. exist anymore, but it was still sort of embedded as a legend. Yeah. Um, and and it was certainly true that if um, if you were bowling from the pavilion end in the 1960s, the uh, the ball would lift more um, or sometimes shoot more. There was a bit of uneven bounce, but the, the pitch was relayed and all the analysis that was done on that afterwards suggested that it had, it had remedied the situation. But nevertheless, the ridge continued to be a, a legend, you know, right up to probably the end of the 20th century. Um, I remember the... Uh, the well, just... I'll come back to Bob Massey in a minute, but I remember the Glenn McGrath effort in um, in 1997, wasn't it? Because yes. we'd, um, unusually, 
you know, we at that point, England went into every series with a sort of sense of imminent doom. And yet at Edgbaston, just before that, we'd, you know, Nasser Hussein and Graham Thorpe had put on a tremendous partnership and England had actually won. And Mark Taylor had been in very poor form at the start yeah. of that tour and, and, and there were you know, rumours that it wasn't a very happy camp. And suddenly England had won the first test, having also done well in the one-day internationals beforehand. And we went to Lords with a huge degree of optimism. And then suddenly Glenn McGrath comes along. And we all know what Glenn McGrath could do. It was mm. impossible to score a runoff. And he was yeah. just nipping it both ways off the seam. And all of a sudden, it's business as usual. Um, and in a way, that kind of, that same feeling emerged in, in 2005, at the start of that great series, when Lords was actually the first test match. Uh, and again, we went into that with a lot of optimism and Australia batted first and we, uh, England bowled them out pretty cheaply with Steve Harmison bowling fast and cutting Ricky Ponting's cheek yeah. with a bouncer and suddenly thought, yeah, we're in this one. We're going to compete. And then Glenn McGrath comes on and bowls yeah. and suddenly it's a heavy defeat for, for England. Mm. And, and we have to, we have, luckily England that time managed to, to recover, but that, that um, that moment of, of that test match in, in um, 1997 was just, it was such a deflating moment for English cricket and such an invigorating one for Australia where they realised, yeah, we're still on top here. We're, yeah. we're not going to lose this series. We're going to just steam through to the end. And it was largely thanks to Glenn McGrath's brilliant spell that that momentum was, was re-achieved. Bob Massey, 1972, only one of the, one of the most interesting characters in cricket that you know if you if you compare his his career his feet to someone like Hedley Verity now Verity was a great bowler for a number of years and he, he took 15 wickets in a test match against Australia um, and then he continued bowling well through the 1930s um, and sadly was, was killed in the second world war very tragically in 1943 in Italy Bob Massey kind of burst on the scene out of nowhere the conditions in that match suited him, you know, atmospherically, pitch-wise, oh. perfectly suited for his bowling. And it must have been one of those days when everything just went right. And and he he was talented enough and, and savvy enough to know how to use those conditions to his advantage. And yet it was it, it was like a sudden brilliant supernova that, that oh. disappeared just as quickly. And he, I know he had a tour to the West Indies the following winter that – didn't yeah. go nearly as well in not so helpful conditions. And he, he faded from the game very quickly after that. So, but thank God he's got that one great match mm. to show how good he was. Um, you know, not, not every cricketer is lucky enough to play test cricket and not every cricketer is lucky enough, even if, even if you've got the talent, not all, everyone's lucky yeah. enough to make a success of it. There are plenty of players who haven't made the most of themselves at test level. But when you've, when you've taken 16 wickets in a test match at Lords against yeah. the world enemy, no one's going to say you weren't good enough. No. And he'll always have that to his credit. So well done, Bob Massey. Um, I mean, Mike, the, the last one he mentioned, Flintoff's um, mm. feet in, in his last test match at Lords. That's, that has to be a personal favourite of mine because I was there. Um, yeah. And it was the... The last day of a, of a thrilling match, we beat Australia for the first time in 75 years. Um, my job at the time involved looking after people in the library on a match day. So I, I didn't get out to see much cricket, but naturally, if I had the opportunity, I would love to go. Uh, I'd love to, to go and just see a few overs. Um, and the library was pretty much empty. But there was one journalist, naming no names, who was in there writing. You know, Australian wickets were falling. We were getting closer and closer to the end. And he was still in there on his laptop. And I'm thinking, what's going on? What, what are you doing? Why aren't mm. you out there watching the game? Surely yeah. that's why you're here. I didn't say this to him, obviously, but that was what was going yeah. through my head. And behind that was, am I going to have a chance to see any of this? Because this is looking mm. like a historic moment that it might, I, know, I might not see again. Yep. Eventually, our department secretary, Sally, um, wandered through and said, I know you want to go out and have a look. Don't worry. I'll look after the, the library for, for a little while. You go out and watch a few overs. So I, I went out. I snuck into the pavilion. I had to edge along the back wall of the long room where I couldn't see a thing. It was so crowded. I went up the, the, the staircase by the home dressing room. And eventually, I, 
the only place I could find a view of the pitch was on the roof terrace. And I just got up there in time to see the last two wickets fall and England claim the victory. And then I, with plenty of other members, I walked back down from the roof terrace and I was actually standing on the landing outside the England dressing room as the England team came back up the steps. Broad grins on their faces um, to, to walk into the dressing room. And, you know, when you work at Lords, you, you don't always get to see a, a, as much cricket as people might imagine. Um, and that really wasn't very much cricket to watch, but it was such yeah. a historic moment and and just to see the England team close up in their moment of triumph that's a day I'm never going to forget uh yeah it brings home how privileged I am to have the job I have absolutely and I I think it was Stephen Fry who did one of those reaction videos on you Lord's YouTube channel and he was reacting to Freddie's um five wickets and he had tears in his eyes Hmm. um because it means so much obviously and um it was quite a significant moment in his Korea, last test match at Lords, he's going to retire at the end of the series. England, because Australia had a pretty good record at Lords for so many years. They never lost a test since. Yeah, I, I remember uh, I did, um, 1934 was the last time. Yeah. I, I, did a, um, I did an interview with um, with a journalist from the BBC a few days before that match where we were talking about the history and, and she was asking whether there was some sort of hoodoo or jinx um, on the England team playing Australia at Lords. And, Luckily, of course, that story didn't last beyond the next five days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in a way, for Flintoff himself, there was a redemptive element to it too, because um, after the great triumph in 2005, there'd been that tour in 2006 7 to Australia, yeah. which Flintoff had captained, and we got beaten 5 0, which, you know, wasn't a great way to follow up the triumph of, of 2005. So for him, he was coming back and showing the Australians that he, he and, and his English fans that he could still compete at the top level and he was still a winner and to end his career on that high note rather than the lower note of the Australia tour, I, I think was a great bonus for him and for all of the, all of us who were watching from an England point of view as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think the one about Bob Massey, just to touch on that, I think Ian Chappell heard him say, he was talking about that match and he said, Oh, Massey got 16 wickets. So the, so the game was over in like three or four days or three days or something like that. And the queen was due to meet the players. <laughs> And they changed it from Lords to Buckingham Palace. Mm-hmm. And you know how Australians are like when they win. Ian Chapel back in those days, drink, you know, mm-hmm. drinking a, a lot. Dennis Lilly wasn't a big drinker back in those days. But they said, oh, Keith, you know, one of his heroes was Ray Linwall. And, and I think Ian Chapel said, oh, Lindy used to have a drink after a game. And, you know, Dennis Lilly was big on Ray Linwall. And he said, okay, if Ray Linwall did that, one of my heroes, I'll have a drink. Mm-hmm. And he just sculled this big jug of beer. And the manager came in and said, guys, we got to go to Buckingham Palace. We can't have any of the players turning up under the weather because you've got to meet the Duke and the Queen. And uh, they went to Buckingham Palace and Ian Chappell was introducing the, the team to Her Majesty and came to Dennis Lilly. <laughs> Ian Chappell said, Your Majesty, Dennis Lilly. And Dennis Lilly said, G'day. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, that's, um, <clears throat> yeah. Just hearing that, I just laughed. And, Another Ashes moment was the centenary test, which didn't count for the Ashes, obviously. Mm. Commemoration of Test Cricket 100 years, England and Australia at the MCG. And the Queen was there as well, meeting the players. And Dennis Lilly asked for her autograph. And I think Her Majesty said kindly, I don't do that. And I think she <laughs> sent Dennis Lilly a signed letter with her signature there, Her Majesty. Um, great, great sense of humour there. But what a test match yeah. that was, the centenary test in 1977. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, got every living cricketer that was alive at the time from Australia and England there. Um, and, you know, the match is remembered for Derek Randall's 100 and Lily taking wickets and Rod Marsh, the late, right, the late great Rod Marsh, um, scoring the first century by an Australian keeper in tests. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Rick McCosker got his jaw broken by Bob Willis and, you know, Kerry O'Keefe, it was a leg spinner, had to open the batting with um, the other opening partner there. Um, it was just an incredible test match, went down the wire, and it was the same margin as it was 100 years ago, uh, mm. 45 runs. <laughs> kind of spooky, but one of the best. It is. It, it's a spooky coincidence. Mm. But a, a, lov- a lovely nod to the history It was that that match was commemorating. It's a pity our own centenary test match at, at Lords in 1980, which commemorated the first test in England, which was at mm. the Oval. We had the centenary test at Lords, but the first match was at the Oval. 
Um, that was slightly ruined by rain, but um, people still got to see a great innings from Kim Hughes, who very nearly hit the ball over the pavilion. Uh, I think he, I think he made a, a very dashing eighty. There was some great cricket in the, in that match, but unfortunately, the the weather got the better of it. But um, yeah, what a what a great period of cricket history with with so many characters and great players around. Uh, absolutely. Um, let's talk about Don Bradman's two fifty four mm. in nineteen thirty. That's probably arguably one of the best innings to be played at Lords. Um, it was the highest score by an overseas player at Lords until Graham Smith got his 259 against um, England 2003. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, Bradman said that his that innings was one of his best in Test cricket. He said in his autobiography, and I quote, practically without exception, every ball went where it was intended. And, um, you know, in that series, he scored 974 runs with four centuries an average of 139.14, 974 runs, which is the most for any test series in the history of the game. No one will ever surpass that. I think I think Wally Hammond came close to it on a tour to Australia. He got 800 runs or something like that. Mm -hmm. A very fine player himself, Wally Hammond, um, for England. And um, he scored 334 in that series at Headingley. He scored 300 of those runs in a day, which is the only time a bat has done that in test cricket. So, Neil... Why is that considered one of the great innings of Lords um, that Lords has ever seen in terms of Ashes contests? And what was Don Bradman's relationship with Lords as a player and also after he retired? I, th I think in terms of, of that particular innings, um, you, you've mentioned the fact that Bradman himself rated it as probably the best he played. Um, and given how many great innings he did play, that, that in itself has to be some recommendation. Um, it, it was the first time he played at Lords, you know, the, the, the home of cricket. We didn't use that phrase then, but the, head, the headquarters of the game, everybody knew it was the most famous, the most prestigious ground in the world of cricket. And for him to, to perform like that in his first Test match appearance on that ground is really quite astonishing. And it, it was, you know, by all accounts, something near perfection as an in innings. Um, it's it's hard to imagine um, now what, what a game changer Don Bradman was in in terms of you know, batting in, in that era, and obviously at the end of that summer England started to think about how they could cope with Bradman on the forthcoming tour of Australia in thirty two thirty three, and we all right. we all know what the result was the, the body line tactic. Um, so the, there was there was something very very different about Don Bradman and. And that innings, even though he'd made more runs at Headingley, the, the fact that it was just so perfect, there were no errors in it, um, that that can only have added to the impression that, that Bradman was something akin to a run-making machine. There was something inhuman about him, which I, I think I think was a lot of the impression that um, that English cricket came out of that summer with, that the that it, it just wasn't, it just shouldn't be possible for a batsman to yeah. be so invulnerable, to make runs so easily without seeming to take any risks. Um, and it's, you know, you, you read the, the accounts of the time from people like Neville Cardis, and it is, um, it is remarkable to think the impression that he made on, on the game of cricket, changed the game of cricket in one short summer. And obviously his career went on like that, even though he, he averaged only just over 50 in the Bodyline series. That was a that was a blip. Um, overall, his career, he was averaging about 100, just dipped below it slightly at the end. And obviously, he became one of, I guess, one of Australia's first national heroes in any context. Yeah. I mean, he his emergence as a national hero was, was probably, it, it happened at the same time that there was a growing sense of, of national identity in Australia that, the country was more than just a British dominion on the other side of the world, that it had its own, it had its own identity, its own culture, its own, it was building its own history. And Bradman was part of that. He gave Australians something to be really proud of because he was unarguably the best in the world. Yeah. And he was an Aussie, an ordinary Aussie guy, you know, not from any hmm. special family or anything. He was just an ordinary yeah. Aussie guy. Um, so he became one of the most important people in Australia on the back of that and over the course of his career. And he was, in many respects, um, the voice of Australian cricket, and the, the people 
that he was the man that, that MCC often turned to to know the voice of Australian cricket on on issues like you know, throwing in the late 1950s on the LBW law. And because he can, he, even though you know he he had a, a separate career as a stockbroker, he never lost his connection with the game. He continued to be involved in its administration. You know, he, he did a stint as a journalist and famously sat in the same um, press box as Douglas Jardine at yeah. one point not long before Jardine's death. I gather they didn't speak to each other, which doesn't surprise me. Um, but he he was such a, a thoughtful man on, on the history of the game that he he continued to communicate with MCC with various of its of its officials and, and prominent people at Lords. Um, in in the same way that that MCC was trying to work for the good of the game and ensure that it evolved in the right way, Bradman had that same agenda as well. You know, he he had his opinions. He was very, um, I, I think, in um, the, the 50, 58, 59 tour, apart from the throwing issue, his his great issue with the cricket played in that series was um, he thought Peter May's captaincy for England was too negative. Um, and he wasn't, wasn't a great fan of that. So he, he was very keen on positive cricket. He, he'd always scored... He wasn't a great six hitter, but he'd always scored runs at a great pace because he scored off practically every ball. Similarly to, to W. G. Grace in that in that sense. So he he was such a preeminent figure in Australian cricket that whatever he said was always going to be taken seriously. And in the same way that you know, in a later generation, Sir Geoffrey Boycott became a a figure of. You know, because he knew so much about the the science of batting and, and how to play the game, Bradman's similar level of knowledge on that and his, his terrific record made him somebody whose opinion you could not ignore. Um, and and his, his his continued involvement with, with the game and its major issues only reinforced that. Yeah, absolutely. And he had a song written for him, Don Bradman. Ah, uh, Don Bradman is he good? Bradman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is a nice song. I've listened to it many times. It's quite a catchy tune um, because they idolised him. And I guess he sort of uh, got sick of that at the end of his career. And when he retired, he, he was over that adulation because he lived it all his life. He just uh, wanted to live his life quietly and um, mm. still answer letters. He used to write to people and they used to send him stuff. He invited cricketers that went to... Adelaide for the test match, uh, he would invite them to his house for tea or um, some sort of uh, function. Um, you know, he invited Tandorker and Shane Warne to his 90th birthday party mm -hmm. at um, at his house uh, just to have a photo opportunity and um, and that. So he was quite a remarkable person. He Don was. And well, the, the, the parallel with Tandorker, you mentioned earlier that um, yeah. there, there was a suggestion, particularly from... Lady Jessie Bradman, that, yes. that Tendulkar was a little bit similar in, in terms of how he batted to, to Don himself. I think th there is another parallel in in the level of fame that those two cricketers enjoyed mm -hmm. in their native countries, and it, it must have been very difficult to cope with that. Um, you know, never never be able to go anywhere unrecognised. Unlike Jim Laker, as you mentioned earlier, Don Bradman couldn't have sat in a in a, in a pub enjoying a pint and a sandwich without being mobbed. Mm. Uh, either in Australia or in England. And I think Sachin Tendulkar enjoy, in, endured something similar yeah. um, in India because his, his popularity was, was so great and his recognisability was, was just so universal. So it's, it's, a, it's a tremendously hard thing for, for sportsmen to deal with when they reach that level of eminence, that the fame that comes with it must, must be very, very difficult to cope with. Yeah, absolutely, um, especially with Bradman and um, just... The amount of letters he would got, uh, get um, on his last tour to England in 48, he got 600 letters, I think, a day. Mm. He had to try and answer them all. Um, and he also was ill on that tour. He was ill. Yeah. He was. He had appendicitis. Um, and Lady Jessie had to come over quickly to be at his side. And he soon recovered and led the, led the team um, as captain. And, um, you know, in that series with the Invincibles, you know, Australia chased down 400 in one of the test matches, I believe it was at Headingley. Mm. They chased down 400 and something. Mm. Bradman got oh, 100 and Arthur Morris got 100. 
as, um, as well in that partnership. Neil Harvey debuted in that series of first test in England for him. He debuted in, in, um, in Australia in that test match against India in Adelaide before the team went out to uh, the series in England in 48. And uh, he was only 18, 19. He was only the, he was the young, <coughs> young fella in the, in the team. And, you know, he, he was too shy to ask Don Bradman for batting advice. So him and Sam Loxton um, were good mates. And he asked Sammy Loxton to go over and ask the boss, you know, Don, about um, he, um, Neil Harvey's batting. Mm -hmm. So Sam Loxton always called Don Bradman George, which was his middle name. He said, George, <laughs> a little friend here he has got a bit of a problem with his batting. Can you help him out? And then so Donald gave the advice to Sam Loxton and Sam Loxton said to Neil Harvey, um, uh, keep the ball along the ground, he said. That's the best advice that he got from Don Bradman, and it worked. He got a century in that mm -hmm. test match at um, Headingley, I believe, uh, if my memory serves me correctly. So even, even to his teammates, he was imposing as a figure. Yeah. And even for Neil Harvey, the youngest member of the group, not to go and speak to him face-to-face. -face um, it was interesting listening to Neil Harvey, who is the last member of the Invincibles. He's well into his 90s. He's still going strong. Um, I've heard him do some interviews on podcasts with people talking about his career and especially talking about Bradman and the Invincibles. So Don Bradman had that sort of imposing figure to his teammates as well to to many people of the opposition and also world cricket, which is unbelievable. A truly remarkable person who lived a, a remarkable life and um, probably the, the closest to him in this modern era is probably Steve Smith, um, averaging 60-plus. He's probably mirroring Bradman's feats. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can't be exactly like Bradman, but many of his records will not be broken. Like 974 runs in a series won't be broken. Uh, averaging 99.94 won't be broken. Um, you know, it just, it's hard to imagine. You can never say never. Yeah, absolute certainty, but it, it is hard to imagine those records. Yeah, it is. It's hard to imagine. Even even though Sachin Tendulkar played more Test matches than Bradman, of course, different era. Of course, Bradman only played 50 Test matches because. The, the war obviously and and there was um, um, a bit a bit of um, you know sort of encouragement to get cricket on after the war especially mm -hmm. in 46 the ashes were contested and they wanted to get cricket started again and Bradman thought well I, I don't really want to play you know I'm sort of towards my end mm -hmm. but okay you know for queen and country or well, king and country back in those days uh, we might as well do what we need to do for the empire so they did um, and uh, he did that and uh, but yeah, he's, you know, going back to Tendulkar, got the, the most runs in Test cricket. But you know, he he can't replicate the feats of Sir Donald Bradman. It's it's very hard. I, I always don't like it when we make comparisons. You mentioned Harry Brook earlier. Mm. People are comparing him to Bradman. You can't really do that because Bradman was just in another league of his own. Um, I don't I don't think Bradman hits over the top as as often or as. Um willingly as harry brook does no. um, i think we'll have to wait probably 10 years before we can start to assess harry brooks mm. place in the pantheon of, of of great players um every there's every indication he'll be up there but um yeah it's a little early days he's been playing test cricket for only a, a short while so far yeah absolutely um we're coming towards the end of this discussion it's been a long one but it's been enjoyable i've enjoyed every minute of it well That's over it. three hours so we're nearly to the end of play, to use that cricket term. We're nearly towards the end of the play for the day's proceedings. Uh, we're nearly to stumps. So we just mm -hmm. got one more question to answer, Neil, and then we'll, we'll finish up today's play. Going a bit over with the over rates. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the problem today with 90 overs. We it's been a long session. We're, we're all ready for a drink, I think. We're all ready for a drinks break. Our, our voices yeah. have crackled under the pressure. <laughs> but uh, we need to go to the tea break and, and, and um, have a have a refreshment. But uh, our last question, of, just on the ashes, Neil, um, we've touched on it a little bit, but uh, what do you consider to be the greatest ashes moments at Lords, um, and the greatest ashes moment in history? Because there's so many, like Ian Botham's heroics in 1981 at Headingley, when <coughs> England were following on, he scored 140 odd with Graham Dilly at the other end, who sadly mm. passed away. Brilliant partnership, Bob. Bob Willis, the late great Bob Willis, took eight wickets. People thought he was on drugs, but he was just on the in the zone. He just yeah. took eight wickets. 
And then Lillian Marsh put a bet on 500 to 1 with the electronic scoreboard, first time there at the ground. And they got some money because England actually won. And then the next test of that series, he, Ian Botham got 5 for 1 in one spell. And England won that test. And, and obviously, you mentioned it earlier with Botham about um, the pair at Lords in that series. He was captain and then soon sacked, and Mike Brearley was brought back in. Um, he was a very good people person. He was a very good captain, Mike Brearley. Um, and uh, they brought him back for that. Um, you, know, you know, even though it didn't count for the Ashes, but the centenary test was a good moment as well. Mm -hmm. um, many great moments like uh, Amazing Adelaide, 2006-07, that test match that went down to the wire, Shane Warne bowling from one end at the cathedral end of the Adelaide Oval, which is the scoreboard end, and he bowled one session straight from that end. Um, Australia won that test match from nowhere, went on to win that series 5-0. You have Shane Warne's 700th wicket at the MCG, which was quite a proud moment. Um, 2005 Ashes, Edge Bastion, England winning by two runs, Kasparich mm -hmm. getting caught down the leg side, and Richie Benno said um, in that famous commentary, um, I think he said, uh, Bowden, and then you know, Billy Bowden mm -hmm. raised the crooked finger of doom and gave Kasparich out. Um, so many great moments in, in the history of Ashes cricket. It's, it's very hard to just pinpoint one, isn't it, Neil? But uh, what do you consider to be the best moments at Lords in Ashes cricket and also overall? Um, I think we've probably mentioned the, the, the highlights I'd, I'd pick out at Lords already, which would be um, that great win in 2009, which was the first for 75 years um, by England, and also the... Um, the Headley Verity um, wicket-taking efforts and how he how he tied Don Bradman up, a man who scored off virtually every ball he faced, um, to the point where he was forced to hit out and just sky the ball straight up in the air. It's it's just astonishing to think, you know, however friendly the conditions might have been to the bowler, how much skill and concentration and match awareness. It, it, it would have taken to achieve that against the best batter the world's ever seen. So Headley Verity's wicket-taking haul in 1934, I, I would say, is, is definitely one of my greatest moments at Lords. Um, probably Ashes or any in any other sense either. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> away from Lords, uh, you just mentioned the the, the Edgbaston win in, in 2005, which I remember mm. watching on television, and I actually had. Um, I was just watching the the highlights from Wellington a couple of nights yeah. ago, and, and the the denouement there was was bringing back all sorts of memories, good and otherwise, yeah. of the tension mm. as, as that match came to a conclusion. Um, and that that was one of those that whole two thousand and five series was just such an intense experience. Not not simply because we'd um, we'd not won an Ashes series as England for, for so long. Um, but also because the quality of the cricket was so great that almost anything could happen at any moment. You, you'd watch Shane Warne strolling up to the wicket to turn his arm over and you'd know that that ball could bring a, a wicket. However, you know, however well the, the batsman at the other end was playing. Same thing with Glenn McGrath particularly those two bowlers. I mean, there was just a, a let, such a level of tension um, and such a requirement to, to work hard for runs when facing those two that it was it was impossible not to feel, as well as you were enjoying it, you were also very stressed watching it if yes. you wanted one side or the other to win. Um, and the, the, the cricket was so tight and so hard fought. And then you come to the end of that match at Headingley, at, um, at Edgbaston, and yeah. suddenly... From thinking England had it sewn up to thinking they'd blown it. And then Harmison bowls what really wasn't that great a ball. It was a mm. it was a, a long hop down the leg side. You know, if Ricky Ponting had been facing, he would mm. have lapped it to square leg for four or six. But it was Kasprovitz, as you say, and um Geraint Jones. Yeah. Uh, had good footwork to get down the leg side in time, and, and that was that. And then you, I, I still remember seeing Brett Lee sink to his haunches mm. after that decision was given. 
And, you know, we will remember Andrew Flintoff coming up to console him a, a moment or two later. But just seeing that deflation of a cricketer who'd been so pumped up, had worked so hard, was so determined and thought he'd got over the finish line practically. And then at the very last moment, it's taken away from him. And he's like a deflated balloon. Um, it, it was hard not to feel sorry for him, even in that moment of triumph, which every England cricket fan wanted. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of any moment that illustrates the drama and tension of Test cricket better than that, whether we're talking Ashes or otherwise. So that would definitely have to be one of my great moments. And then I'm, I'm going to conclude by going back to a, a moment you've also mentioned um, Headingley 81, which, like many of my generation, was uh, the match that really stimulated my love of cricket. I don't remember Ian Botham batting, but I do remember Bob Willis steaming mm. down the hill from the Kirkstall Lane end with his hair flying behind him and his, his mad eyes staring at the batsmen, um, mad eyes that continued as he, as he ran off the field at the end. It was just, as you say, he was in the zone. He was on a different planet. Um, and it was that day, that moment, that bowling spell um, that, that turned the game and the series on its head. Because even after Botham's innings, Australia didn't need that many to win. It was 120 odd. Mm. And without Bob Willis's fabulous bowling, another cricketer we've sadly lost in, in recent years far too early. Um, uh, that that whole history of um, the series and possibly in Botham's career would have been very different. Yes, absolutely. And he was a wonderful cricketer, Ian Botham. Um, mm. Wonderful performances as an all-rounder. Um, at that time, especially with the other all-rounders like Imran Khan, um, mm. you know, and um, those other, Richard Hadley as well, Kapil Dev, um, great all-rounders in that era, and he was one of them. Mm. Um, if I had to choose an Ashes moment from, or well, not just Lords, but uh, Ashes in general. I'd probably go with Adelaide Oval, amazing Adelaide, yeah. just because I've been there. I, I'm from Adelaide. What a test match that was. Just watching the highlights, mm. just unbelievable. Michael Hussey, still remember him. Anderson, he's still playing now, James Anderson. And that was like 2006, six seven. He's still playing. He's well into his 40s. Um, bowling this ball outside off stump and – Hussey, one of my favourite players, Michael Hussey, gritty cricketer, left-hander, hit it through the covers and went to the boundary, him raising his hands up in, in the bat and the Australian team coming. Um, that that game should have been a draw, but I liked Shane Warne's attitude. He said, no, it's not a draw, we're going to win. And he bowled well and he took wickets. The run out of Bell drama, England were playing for survival and they went on to lose that Ashes series 5-0 because that test match in Adelaide pretty much changed the course of that series. So I'll probably consider that to be one of my favourites. But, you know, it's up to you, really. Personal choice, I suppose. There, there will always be personal memories associated with these things. Um, there's, there's no absolute objective greatest moment um, in Ashes cricket. Yeah. And there have been so many great moments, so many stories, personal stories around them. I mean, just think of the first match, that, that, that test at the Oval in 1882, when it was so tense that reportedly... Um, we know one spectator died at the, the height of the tension, um, probably from a pulmonary embolism. Another one is reported to have chewed through the um, handle of his umbrella. I don't, I'm not sure I believe that one, but mm. um, it's a great story. Um, but it do, does illustrate the tension and drama that, that we've seen in Ashes cricket throughout its history. Um, the odds are we'll have a bit more of that over the coming months. Yeah, absolutely. With England playing baseball and doing that now, it's <laughs> going to be an exciting series. Yeah. But even for me, just watching Ashes series in England from Australia, obviously time difference, late at night. Mm -hmm. I remember the last Ashes where Australia won, well, retained the Ashes at Old Trafford where Steve Smith got 200. And I uh, still remember the last wicket, Josh Hazelwood bowling, um, got rid of Craig Irvington, it was, LBW. And they had to review it. But my finger was straight up. Being an umpire myself, <laughs> you just know it's out. It was plumb. Yeah. I was like that. Four o'clock in the morning. Here in Australia, watching that test match, fourth test, Steve Smith came back. We didn't mention it about him and Jofra Archer, um, that famous battle where he got hit um, mm -hmm. and Archer was bowling rapid. And Smith, you know, courage, especially you need courage as a batter facing fast bowling, that quality. 
but I still remember that wicket to this day, and that's probably one of my special moments. And I'm pretty sure I woke up my whole neighbourhood screaming, yelling at the TV, and say, "We've done it." <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't win the series outright, and it was two-two, obviously. But hopefully, Australia can win their first Ashes series outright in England since Steve Waugh did it in 2001, which was another Ashes moment I forgot to mention. Steve Waugh's famous century at the Oval with his calf, both his calves yes. were raising his bat like I that. I um, remember gritty well. cricketer Steve Waugh. Um, and his last was. ball of the century, last ball of the day, century at the SCG, two three. Yeah. Uh, we hit Richard Dawson through the covers before, and Bill Laurie said he's done it. Um, <laughs> a century, last ball of the day for, and he was under pressure at that time, Steve Waugh as well. Mm -hmm. That could have been the end of his Test career. That could have been his last Test, but he played on for another year and retired against India the next summer. But so many Ashes moments. Um, 1989. When Australia came over, mind me. <laughs> the one four nil on the best of six, and mm. they said at the time of the press in England, um, the worst side, to, worst Australian touring side to tour England. That's always and a bad Alan, move. That's always a bad, that's always a bad move when you say that. You're setting yourself up. As, yeah, as a, as no, they, went, they went on to win four nil with Alan Border and Bob Simpson really turned that Australian team around and started mm. the dominance. Mm. And there's so many ashes moments over the years. I think I remember one, the Vazarium situation. I think that pitch that had Vazarium on it and Derek Underwood took wickets. Yes. At, uh, that was 1968, it was. wasn't it, I think? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it was a bit of Vazarium on the pitch, a bit of a fungus. Mm -hmm. The outfield was lush and green and the pitch was like this dark sort of dry colour because apparently the grounds, groundsman said, well, it has a fungus, Vazarium. <laughs> and he was deadly. Well, that was his nickname, Deadly Underwood. It was. It was he was more of a medium pacer who can bowl spin, mm -hmm. but if, if you put him on a wet wicket with a bit of moisture, geez, you could run through sides like that. And he certainly did that to Australia in that Ashes series. There he, he was a great goal. That, that combination of Underwood and Knott took an awful lot of wickets for England and Kent. Um, yes, a pretty good keeper. Good. Alan Knott, as you mentioned, a yeah. uh, yeah. pretty good keeper for England. Um and so many great players that have played in the Ashes over the years on both sides. It's just oozing with history. Well, Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed listening to Neil Robinson, Head of Heritage and Collections at Lord's Cricket Ground and MCC on Ashes Moments at Lord's. If you haven't done so already, you can check out the historical series episodes we did on Lord's Cricket Ground and the MCC with Neil, which are available on the Dibbly Dobbly podcast YouTube channel.